Thanks for this opportunity to present at this conference on teaching dynamics and control with Arduino-based TC Lab. Glad to be here virtually in Austin where I did my graduate studies a few years ago with Professor Tom Edgar. I'm now at Brigham Young University and have been here for 10 years. Previously I was seven years in industry. One of the things that I saw from industrial practice is that it's very critical to have hands-on labs that students can use to develop intuition about dynamics and control. And so over the course of this presentation, I'll share some of the things that we've done on developing a lab and be able to give that to each student individually so they can develop this same intuition about modeling, estimation, and control and they're in their studies. Let me talk about why automation is needed. Um, across industries and then I'll share these 35 lesson modules that have been developed also this pocket-sized lab overview and also some collaborative community resources we'd love to get your thoughts and suggestions as well so automation has impacted many industries and as you can see from you know medical fields transportation product, uh, how we buy things. You might on a cell phone order something and it may get delivered to your GPS location, but also many new topics in automation and control with data science, analytics, machine learning, cybersecurity, and digitalization. The resources developed include MATLAB, LiveScript, and Simulink uh, models that can be used in conjunction with the Process Dynamics and Control course. This is the version of the course that I use where I take students from a controller objective all the way through the modeling and then control development. And with that, there are 35 modules that have been developed in collaboration with MathWorks. Joshua Hammond, uh, in particular, uh, worked on these. He's a student at UT Austin right now. In each of these, there are three modules. The theory, uh, which includes a lesson, the simulation, which is the assignment that they do before they do the lab, which is a temperature control lab for each of these modules. And the course and the MathWorks modules are listed there below for access. So as we think about learning from an instructor perspective, you might have a lab that is, uh, you know, a large lab that's in a unit operations lab or other place in the, chemi in the engineering department and you have a number of students um, and they all have to schedule time to work on that lab. But let's say uh, it becomes difficult because of um, access to the lab is limited or there's just a growing enrollment in that area, then um, the alternative is to give a lab to each student. So the student highlighted in blue from their perspective, they have to wait for a limited amount of time that they can work in the lab maybe once a semester twice a semester versus a take-home lab that they can use throughout the course even in class for exercises and so we found that this to be much more effective and I'll interview a couple students uh, here and and uh, we'll show some of their feedback as well some of their observations going through this course with the MathWorks material and the live scripts I'm Zachary Hillman I'm from Southern Arizona uh, I'm Nathan Barrett, and I'm from Central Colorado. So I've worked with other programming languages, but I've never worked with MATLAB prior to this semester, and so that was that's my experience. I, don't mm. know. I mean, same. I've I have known quite a few programming languages, but I've never done MATLAB before. But in my experience, the MATLAB live scripts have been pretty similar to like Jupyter Notebook and other like computational tools that we've used so far. It was pretty simple to pick up, even without ever looking at it before. Conceptually, as it was a process dynamics course, I did have to uh, work with some friends just to, you know, get through the concepts part. But as far as using MATLAB, it was pretty straightforward uh, once I picked up the syntax. Mm -hmm. That was my experience. Yeah, same. I mean, as with most other computational tools, the documentation is pretty well, like, documented online. Um, so I've used that a lot to answer a lot of my questions, whether it be like a syntax thing of like, oh, how do I solve an ODE or plot something? Um, I just sort of Google it and then hop on the MathWorks website and the documentation's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. What's really great about the interactive ones is that you don't have to write up the entire script just to 
you know, try something out. And so because I was able to kind of change the system that I was modeling just bit by bit, it was, I was able to see how the system reacts and kind of train my intuition. And so later on in the course, I didn't have to do so many mistakes right at the beginning, but I knew how the process would kind of end up just because I had already trained that. Mm -hmm. Uh, my experience has been pretty similar. Um, I like the balance between like the code that's given to us and the code that we have to create ourselves. Because on the one hand, like our purpose in the in the course here is to learn how to control things and the algorithms and the procedures to do those things, not necessarily learn learning how to code and things. So the amount of code that's been present already has kind of taken away some of those like more nuanced or you know detailed, more code driven aspects of the course. But then there's like enough code that's there to help us accomplish the tasks that we have. But at the same time, it's not like we don't do any coding at all because we still have to be familiar enough with how, you know, the existing code is structured. Um, and then, then we have to make our own code on top of that to work with it and then also further it to accomplish our goals. The hardest part uh, for me is, I don't, rem I don't remember quite why I thought this, but at the beginning of the course, I think there was a, one of the tutorials that encouraged us to use MATLAB within Jupyter Notebook. And while it was pretty cool to learn how to like, you know, change the engine with which Jupyter Notebook runs, I have just seen that running it within the native MATLAB environment has been way better yep. for and debugging and for plotting and just for coding in general. And so like, I guess one thing I wish I would have known is just, I would just do the whole thing in the native MATLAB environment from the, the bat. Those live scripts. That's mm -hmm. what, exactly, yeah. They work really well. It really depends on their past experience with MATLAB because right at the beginning, like I said, picking up a new language, um, that's a steep curve. And so if they haven't had any experience, just to expect the very beginning to be full of mistakes. And that's how you learn uh, programming language is to mess up on the syntax, look it up, and then move forward. But if they have had experience with it, um, I would say just not to be daunted by uh, sometimes there's problems that require a lot of coding just to be able to get through it and there are many students that are intimidated by that and I would say that they shouldn't be it it works it's just all the math that we've been learning the entire time mm -hmm. uh, I would say along similar lines uh, some students might be tempted to just use the code that's there because it's programmed and and not have any desire to have like a thorough understanding of how it works and while that might work pretty early on because the things we're doing are pretty simple, I feel like as the course goes on and as we're learning to do more and more complicated things, it is really helpful to have a thorough understanding of, okay, this is exactly what this function has done. No, it's given to me, so I don't need to program it myself. But just at least knowing what it's doing, and that has been like super helpful for me to understand how I should then use that function that's been given to me to do another more advanced goal and so I guess to summarize, one thing that I would suggest for a new beginning student is, especially at the beginning of the course, make sure you're, that you are very familiar with each of the functions and codes that have been given to you. And don't just, you know, take it at face value and just sort of mm -hmm. run through your homework just to get it done kind of thing. Show some quick examples in class, just because uh, even students who are familiar with coding, like I said, uh, many people get daunted by that. So if you just show look, it's just these quick, simple lines or maybe a flow chart of what's going on so that way they know what, the, what a specific function does. I think that would help the understanding uh, quite a lot because a lot of times people get lost kind of in the different loops and things like that. But if there was a flow chart that explained it or if you just go through it in class, I think the students would then really understand what's going on, what it's doing, and why we do it. Well, thank you for that. Uh, they've been fantastic students this semester. And I'd also like to talk about some of the foundations. Uh, and this is kind of like a plane flight where you're taking off and students often need to have some of this background. Uh, and that's just the basics of learning MATLAB. And so there's been modules that have been developed uh, to help students just be able to get off the ground with their programming and to be able to navigate around. So that doesn't become an obstacle towards learning the dynamics and control. Uh, then from active learning, we in this class we have these learning modules that uh, give this hands-on data to 
students where they can work through each of these exercises and really have an elevated experience with uh, being able to put the theory into practice. And then at the very end, I also like them to synthesize, uh, synthesize what they're doing uh, from all these learning modules, all the specifics into this general overview of what it takes to really uh, tackle a control problem. So if somebody came, came to them later in industry and said, hey, we need you to develop a controller for uh, this particular application, maybe like a tank level in a refinery. Uh, they wouldn't feel intimidated by it. They would say, okay, I've gone through these steps before. I know the general approach and I know how to, in, in the big picture overview, how to address this type of control problem. So with that, we developed this uh, pocket size transient heat transfer lab that has a heater and a temperature sensor. And you can see it in action here where you have a set point that changes. Um, and this is sped up. These are number of seconds on the x-axis. And you can see the heater automatically responding. So this is what they're going for in the end, is develop all the modeling, estimation, and control so that they can, in practice, be able to control this device, the temperature of this device. So it has um, uh, two actuator heaters that are next to each other and two temperature sensors. So if you slide, for example, a coin in between them, uh, maybe like a copper coin, a penny, uh, then they become very coupled. Uh, but if there's an air gap in between them, then they don't feel as much of the effect. But it's still a, a simple multivariate control problem, or you can use it as a univariate uh, control problem as well. Uh, here are some commands with MATLAB. And uh, this is just to connect to the lab, uh, lab equals TC lab. We turn on the LED to 80, we display the current temperature, and we adjust the heater to 50%. So those are some of the syntax uh, uh, instructions that I give to students right at the beginning. And it's fairly easy to connect and to uh, read a temperature or to control the heater. And if you have two heaters and two temperature sensors, then it's just uh, Q1 and Q2 for the two heaters and T1 and T2 for the two temperatures. So here are, for example, lab exercises one through four. And you can see we start with a step test. Uh, we do some modeling like convective heat transfer, radiative heat transfer, linearizing the differential equations. Uh, because you have temperature to the fourth with uh, radiative heat transfer. Uh, and then other modules as well. So I'll just show an example with the TC lab building a model from scratch. Sometimes it's good to let a student uh, build this all the way themselves so that they get uh, familiarity with how the signals, the raw signals come in, like a voltage, and how that's converted into a temperature. And then we do manual control, like uh, step tests, where we generate uh, step responses and then get the response and then turn that into um, a process model. And let me just let this go a little bit faster here. I'm going to speed this up. Okay, so we have uh, these uh, heaters that I've changed and you can see the response in real time. So they can drag those heaters to the left and right and change them as they go. And then we go on to other lab exercises as well. This is 5 through 10 uh, where we do a graphical FOPDT fit, a first order plus dead time fit, all the way up to uh, P only control, observe some offset, uh, PI control, and then PID control. So we have these um, modules. These are the live scripts that have been developed and you can see here it's very nice because it's um, here we have the process model and you can see you know just dragging it to the right and left uh, where you have a gain, a time constant, and dead time. And students can interact with these so they can see the simulation and then further on they can then interact with the actual hardware through these live scripts as well. So they do it in simulation first, uh, and then they practice implementing it with the real hardware.
I'd have to say that, you know, from a MATLAB standpoint, because as I said, I've worked with other languages, this one really works well for math and the type of things that we're doing. And it's really great. Uh, for example, in this class, we used the TC lab. We were able to code up the theory or do the, the math by, uh, by hand for the theory. And then we were able to see it work. And that was something that's that's pretty special, and one of the one of the reasons I became an engineer is because I, I love to do something on paper and then how it affect the real world. And so by using these live scripts that are kind of modular and let you run sections at a time, it really helps you see, oh, this algorithm isn't just magic. It's it's something that's correcting itself. It's helping the process know what's going on and take into account everything around it. And that that was something that was really cool for me to learn uh, in this past semester. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that I think has been the most interesting for me is up until the up to this point in my chemical engineering experience, most everything that we do is just you know here's a hypothetical situation, hypothetical reactor, you know an ideal equation that represents what it does. But this has been one of the very first times that we've actually been able to have a physical system that we can control and manipulate. And so it's not like we have to deal with non-ideology, non-idealities or fluctuations or things like that. And it's just been cool to use our skills in mathematics, in coding and things like that to actually control a real life system as opposed to just, you know, running the the balance equations or, you know, modeling an ideal system that isn't actually real. We have some additional exercises that allow them to see the response as they drag these back and forth. Okay, then we get into tuning controllers. That's lab exercises 11 to 16. One of these exercises is, is to build a PID control. And what they do is they take their heater value, which was formerly in manual, and turn that into a set point. And then uh, we'll just adjust the scope to have three things that we output. One of them is going to be the set point, and then we'll also include a PID controller. And the PID controller is uh, just from the model library. We're going to add a summation there um, to be able to give the feedback control. And then we'll also bring off the heater value. Uh, so we'll have set point, heater value, and also the actual PV value of the controller. Then they can adjust the proportional, the integral, and the derivative, put some output limits from 0 to 100, do some anti-windup methods, and there they have a complete controller that they turn from manual into automatic. And then they can see the response. I'll just adjust these windows here so that you can see as you change set point, you can see the blue line, which is the heater value. The yellow line is the set point and the orange line is the PV value. And then on the fly, they can change the controller gain, for example, I change that from 10 to 15. You can see it um, made it more aggressive. Uh, you can see some of the real things like the measurement noise there. You can also go on to other modules like model predictive control. And in this case, we have a set point range. The two mid plots, those are the two temperatures. And then you can see the move plan. That little black line on the bottom shows the current time and the next move plan. And then prior to that is the actual move plan that was had taken place. So you can see a future prediction horizon which, with those dashed lines, how it's attempting to get to that new set point. So there's additional modules as well around model predictive control. And these might be too advanced for an undergraduate course, but they're there as well, just in case you'd like to use those in your course. So this is going to go for about 10 minutes. Uh, and students are going to be able to see the value of a predictive model instead of a feedback control system. They're using model predictive control with optimizers and this temperature control lab. Now, we can also train the models as we go. And this is an example of estimation and control. In the purple area on the left, that's the past or the moving horizon estimation. And so it's using uh, that, that window 
of measurements in order to be able to, to estimate the model as it goes and then use that model as a predictive controller. So it's combining the modeling, estimation, and control into one application. And here you can see the window that it's looking at. So that's the moving horizon, uh, both for the MHE and then the receding horizon control for the model predictive controller. And I've just visualized here the K1 and K2 values. Those are two of the parameters that we're estimating just by the size of the dot there, um, right around 400 seconds right now. And so you can see what the estimator is doing. Uh, you can visualize what's happening with the, the math and how it's optimizing and how it's using that to predict forward in time and be able to control uh, this, um, this temperature. Okay, so both temperatures. This is a coupled temperature multivariate control problem, and we're using model predictive control uh, to do it. So again, uh, probably a little bit too advanced for uh, beginning course in control, but uh, definitely an applicable module if you'd like to use it. Now a final example is through machine learning. Uh, this is one where we look at eight. Um, these are supervised learning methods and then three unsupervised learning methods. And it's learning whether the heat is on or off by looking at the temperature, the derivative of the temperature, and the second derivative of the temperature. And so students use this to look at these different machine learning methods uh, to be able to, you know, to train it. In this first section, you're going to see it training. And then in the next section, you're going to see that once it's trained, I think on about the first 50 minutes of data, then it's going to turn on uh, these, these uh, predictions of, of what it learned through the training exercise. And so with this temperature control lab, we're also doing classification uh, on whether the heater is on or off. Now this could be for something like equipment monitoring, um, predictive maintenance, or other types where you learn whether the heater's on or off, but then you're also able to predict it. So you can see all of these uh, classification methods, uh, especially the supervised learning methods, they're doing a fairly good job of predicting when the heater is on or off, just based on the temperature and the temperature derivative and second derivative. And so you could do some type of predictive maintenance as well. Like let's say the heater was commanded to be on, uh, but uh, there was no corresponding signal in the output or the label. Uh, so this is an example of, of how we use the temperature control lab for some more advanced topics as well, including model predictive control and machine learning. So um, as you can see, some of the, uh, the classification methods are better than others, and it gives students an opportunity to really hone in on some of that intuition about uh, some of these modeling methods like classification, for example. If you'd like a TC Lab as an instructor evaluation, please send an email here. Melda will send out a survey as well to be able to collect some of that information. We'd be glad to send one to you. I just need your name, shipping address, and course information. Uh, and it typically arrives in about three business days or a little bit longer for international. And then students can also just order these directly online and uh, it scales up for class sizes. I've seen anywhere between 10 to 100 students in the class. There are also some community resources that we put together through com uh, cash uh, teaching resources and also Brian Douglas has done a great job with resourcium.org. So I encourage you to take a look at those as well for additional modules and resources that you can use. I'd like to thank all the collaborators. Uh, you know, Joshua Hammond has been a big help here, but many others that are listed here. And uh, it's taken a community of people to develop some of these modules and learning exercises. And also, if you'd like additional information, there are a number of articles that have been published about the educational value of the TC Lab and how it's been implemented in the classroom. So I encourage you to take a look at some of those as well. 
Thank you for your attention today, and we'll be glad to answer any questions.